All right, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Nagel, and today we have on Chris Naganuma. He's a 11 Bravo uh, combat veteran in Iraq, uh, part of the Strikers, um, as well as uh, we have a rich history with you. We just discussed it. He was uh, uh, he works he, he runs the account uh, Project Leaflet as long as well as a Blood and Steel, and your current events manager for Hardhead Veterans, and it also was the former CEO of Exhibit the rapper's cannabis brand to, to sell. So hopefully it's a solid, <laughs> solid intro. Chris, thanks for coming on and uh, uh, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, really happy to be here. Uh, awesome. We uh, just, so we're going to dive right into that. So what, what, what happened with the CEO of the, of the cannabis company for exhibit? How did that come along? I just want to dive right into that. <laughs> so yeah, it gets a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> it's a kind of a long story, um, but I'll keep it short. Uh, I used to be agency arms operation manager, and I was one of their assets when I was shooting for them. And uh, X <clears throat> is a big gun guy, and his dad's a prior Marine and uh, or former oh, really? Marine. And um, so that's a big kind of a thing that has focused a lot of his attention and his life, you know, and how he ran and how he was grown up. And so he ran a, a company called Napalm Cannabis Co. And a lot of the products that were developed for it, um, like we did a big joint that was eight grams and we did it inside of a glass formed uh, hand grenade. Mm -hmm. uh, we did like all of our flour, came in like a 3D printed bomb out of a uh, like a 1942 bomber. Um, and we did all of our names for like our pens and things were like Tomahawk and B-52 and um that's awesome yeah, yeah. so it, it really kind of it, it melded both ways really well and i came about it um because i had known x from when i was with agency a long time ago he had seen a video that i was doing um with sage at the time and we were shooting around vehicles and shooting through vehicles and showing like how how uh, bullets stop in certain areas and don't in others and he saw it and like thought it was super cool and reshared it on his page and I got all hyped up because I grew up in L.A. and he was a big um, artist that I followed. And so I just sent him a message and we actually started talking and mm -hmm. years went on. And it just turned out that one day he ended up calling me and TMZ picked up Napalm. And they were saying that it was actually problematic for veterans and for the Asianic community. And so he called me and was like, am I truly offending people? And I need some help. And so we got to talk in, I went out and did a, um, a couple of right seat, left seat rides and told him I could, I'd be willing to come on and help him as a CEO and direct the company in the right way. Mm -hmm. And I was there for about a year and lined it up for a sale that ended up going to Buddy's group. So now it's a multi state it's a, operation, much larger. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So I'm assuming he was pretty happy with that. He was pretty happy with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how did it? So you're just like, all right, cool. Do this for a year, build this company up, and then sell it off. Then that's kind of you know, I, was, I was actually hoping that that would uh, transition me a little bit more out of the defense industry. Um, cannabis mm -hmm. has always kind of been something I had a, a high interest in, and yeah. like seeing how the plant grows and actually helps guys, um, especially those that are getting like fed pills, like myself, and looking for mm -hmm. our 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 uh, like alternative means to you know, other than a man-made pill. And so I was hoping yeah. that that was going to be something that uh, I stayed there for a little bit longer, but I, I kind of worked myself out of a job um, lining it up for mm -hmm. sale. <laughs> so what year was that roughly? Oh, it was just, uh, I want to say 19, maybe. Uh, no, no. Oh, 20. So pretty recent. It, was, it was very recent. I just moved back to Colorado not too long ago. So I think it was actually 20, mm -hmm. 2021, 2020. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's like an amazing opportunity, though. I mean, to be able to do that, like it, pump it up and then, pff, hey, you know. Yeah, and it go. gave me a lot more understanding of big business. You know, like uh, yeah. that, that we were dealing with 500 dispensaries. And um, previously, I, I run a company called S3F and S3F Solutions. And so I'd seen things in kind of a smaller scale, um, mm -hmm. not in like the tens of millions of dollars. And so this really kind of gave me a better understanding of like how overseas um, procurement works and, you know, moving product on ships and, um, technology. So it, I, as a business owner, it, I really appreciated the opportunity. Yeah. Just kind of gave that massive scale, what a lot of people don't really run into a lot then. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll backtrack a little bit then. So, right, so where where are you from, and then w- what got you like into the military? What years was that, and et cetera? Yeah, so initially, um, I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, that's pretty much. I was born in San Diego, but spent most of my time in LA. And growing up, um, I was a pretty problematic kid. Um, you know, I was not a good kid. Got arrested twice in the same week. Like. Just mm-hmm. not going down the right path. And uh, one morning I turned on my TV and I watched an airplane fly into a tower. And that kind of, um, that really kind of switched, I guess, a bit of mentality in my head. Um, I didn't really necessarily understand what I was seeing. I, I had never seen anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and once my dad kind of started under explaining to me what was happening, and I started researching more and understanding what was going to happen, uh, I wanted to be a part of it. And so um, at the time, I had been getting kicked out of a bunch of schools for being a bad kid and didn't really have a lot of other options. And so to me, it was like, well, shit, like this is all happening. Let's go talk to a recruiter. And um, that kind of led me down the path after I spoke to an Army, Marine, and a couple other recruiters, and I ended up settling on the Army. So did you, so was that nine eleven then? And then did, what year did you graduate? How long was it till you actually went in? I never graduated. Um, so I actually mm-hmm. dropped out in 10th grade um, and was just kind of bouncing around schools. And mm-hmm. uh, when the impact happened, I was, I think I was 16 turning I was 17, I think, or just around that age. And mm-hmm. when I went to go talk to the recruiter, they put me into the DEP program. So the delayed entry program. Yeah. And so I had to kind of wait for all that time frame for me to turn 18 um, because my parents wouldn't sign off on me uh, being 17 yet. And Mm -hmm. my birthday was November 3rd and I shipped out November 7th. Nice. (laughs) So like right out the gate. I I could get out. Yeah. 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 No, I know how that is too. I was, I was graduate 05 and then I was on a July of 05. I was rocking and rolling. Yeah. But no, yeah, that's awesome. So what, what made you choose the infantry? Like I said, you kind of shopped around a little bit, did a little bit of research. Was there any kind of outside influence that like was like, hey, gear you one way or the other? Or is it just like Army had the best pitch? Army had the best pitch. Um, that, was, yeah. that was honestly it at the time. Um, job wise, I, I, I knew what I wanted to do and I wanted to do something combat arms. And so when mm-hmm. I – the two main reasons that kind of drove me to the Army was uh, – I knew in my head I, I was either going to be Army or Marine. And mm-hmm. um, I think predominantly now that I look back at that, it was just because I didn't really have a lot of understanding about a lot of the branches and a lot of the jobs inside of all the branches. You know, I think there would have been some jobs like in the Navy that I thought was super cool. SWIC's a great program. Um, mm-hmm. You know, JTAC and all those other guys do some great stuff. But for me, when I enlisted, I had gone to the Army and I said, this is what I want to do. Um, what are my options? And they kind of gave me like four or five options of, that were fell into that region. Um, they said, hey, go do some research, um, come back and tell me what you want to be. And so I chose infantry and I came back and the recruiter said, well, this is what we'll, we can offer you if this is what you want to do. And it was like, I think they gave me 4,000 signing bonus. I got like 80,000 for college, choice of duty station, guarantee of MOS, and like a few other <laughs> wow. things. And, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and so I was like, oh, this is all great. And I went right next door to the Marines and I was like, look, man, here's everything that the Army has offered me. If you can just guarantee me one of these, um, I'll I'll enlist in the Marines right now. And I still remember to this day, the recruiter looking right at me and being like, I can't guarantee you any of those, but you can be a Marine. <laughs> And I was like, cool, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I packed up my pack and went right over to the, the army. And I was like, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and that's what's crazy is like my, yeah, my brother was a recruiter and it's just like, they tie Marines Corps ties their hands behind your back. Like, you know what I mean? Like I was like, they offer nothing other than nothing. just be like, you can earn the title. And yeah. it's just like, really? That's the pitch. You know, I went in the same way. Like I knew I wanted to, I just, I just like signed the paper. I was like, Hey though, is there any, and, and he, he said, told me the same, he goes, this isn't the army. 
<laughs> I was like, what? Okay, man. I'm just fucking asking. Yeah, like, why asking. are you, why are you being a dick? Yeah. Like I'm joining, you know, like, and, and yeah, I agree. I think the Marine Corps is the, the worst recruitment. Just yeah, absolutely. They look yeah. good, right? Like yeah. that's. Yeah. They look great. Yeah, yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I love the uniform, but I was like, yeah. you know, I wanted, I wanted a, a couple more things, I think, uh, making my mm-hmm. investment in. No, absolutely. Yeah, that, I completely understand that. There's guys I knew actually it was a family friend of ours got like a twenty thousand dollars signing bonus for being a combat engineer. We went oh, in yeah. like the same week. He joined the army, or you know, he shipped out to the army, and within a week, I was you know going to the Marine Corps. And he's like, "Yeah, I got twenty grand." I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> you know, I'm like coming back from boot camp with like twelve hundred bucks in my pocket. I know. Thinking, yeah, you yeah. Know, that, I'm yeah, sure you didn't it. get a whole lot back then, but there was definitely other yeah, yeah. you getting paid. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. So what was your first duty station? And then, you know, rolling into your first combat deployment? I got pretty lucky. I spent my whole career with the striker brigade. Um, okay. and when I went through basic, I was actually tasked to go to 10th mountain. Um, and at the time, uh, the war was really starting to pick up pretty heavy and it just started. And the army mm-hmm. had come out with a new vehicle called the striker. And so when the striker got initiated, all of us that were in basic, I mean, I want to say like 80% of us, we had our orders cut. And then the next day, literally all of our orders were recut. And all mm-hmm. of, a majority of all of us were heading to Lewis. Um, and so mm-hmm. Fort Lewis, Washington became the home of the striker. Uh, and we fell into the units. And when we got there, there was pretty much almost no NCO control um, previously months uh, to me showing up. And when I had just mm-hmm. shown up, second bat had pushed a very large amount of their squad leaders, team leaders over to the strikers because they were recruiting so heavily as well. They didn't have placement for all their new guys coming in. Um, so it gave mm-hmm. them a time to get squad lead and team lead time. So most my whole entire career was spent at Fort Lewis. Um, and then my time frame to deployment was uh, I, I joined November 7th. I graduated March 28th and I was in Iraq, uh, October 28th. Oh shit. No. Wow. So, what, what year was that? Uh, 2004. Four. Okay. That was pretty, wow. Yeah. So holy per- shit. So that's in a while. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So how was that first tour going over? I mean, that was Oh four timeframe. That must've been pretty wild. It was an intense time frame. Um, you know, it's, I think you, you kind of go through some of those experiences and you don't really, I guess I was young, you know, like I'm the baby of my platoon and an, of my company. So I'm the youngest guy that came into them before they deployed. Um, and so to me, I had my 19th birthday in Iraq um, and mm-hmm. seeing, I think all of that and experience in it really, really kind of started to, to shape me um, pretty heavily for like years after. Uh, and the first initial deployment was pretty hard. You know, we saw a lot of fighting, um, a lot of insurgencies and a lot of early shifts that maybe guys after us didn't see. Um, like for example, EFPs became like a really big thing after our deployment. Um, our deployment, we had a lot of really big IEDs, like 500 pound IEDs, 700 pound IEDs, everything remote detonated. So you knew they were close to you. Um, and everything back then was speed based, you know, the striker goes 70 plus miles an hour. So for us, it was, can we get past the remote detonation before they actually detonate? Um, and I think that op tempo of just seeing the savagery of what came out of 2004, 2005, that, that was definitely a hard, um, it jaded me for the rest of my career because I thought everything was going to be this way. And I thought the leadership was going to be good. Um, and then you just see like things start to change. Right. And, uh, it just wasn't mm-hmm. as good. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed there too. I mean, you know, I, I was Iraq 06, so I, that was pretty intense time as well. I was there, I got there on ground March of 06. So yeah, I mean that whole time frame, you know, it's just, I don't want to say wild west, but it kind of was like wild west. And like I said, you were even there before I was, and you know, some of our senior guys were, had, had gone through the Fallujah battles and whatnot. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just, it was kind of a crazy time. So coming off that first deployment then, and you said going on to your second, this is, uh, you end up getting crushed by a striker. I saw something in, you know, that you were talking about, like what all happened there and like, how did your kind of career go after that first one? So 
after my first deployment, I was on a pretty big high. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that was like, um, taking it to 11, right? Like I, I had seen Mm -hmm. life and I was like, Oh, I've done some stupid stuff, but this is like adrenaline all the way up. Like, I love this. And, um, coming back for coming back into it, you know, no unit stays the same, especially in big army. And so guys started making shifts and, um, units started getting moved around and guys started getting moved around and we started prepping for a second deployment. And we had a lot of new guys that were in the unit at the time prepping for their first deployment as well. And, uh, we were doing a big two week train op and we were on the last day of the training and we were getting ready to head out to Iraq again. Um, and I think it was like a month's time, two months time. And one of the new guys was ground guiding a new driver and he wasn't really doing the best job. And the driver couldn't see to his right out of the striker. Uh, he had C wire, Constantino wire up on the truck, on the truck. So trying to see out of the port views was too hard. And, uh, mm-hmm. the trucks come in and they, they kind of like park next to each other, you know? And mm-hmm. I was on the back of a striker with the ramp down talking to my team. And he just drove that striker right up the back of the ramp and pinned me in between. And so, oh, wow. Yeah. So, messed me up seven like rotated vertebrae, whole compressed neck, two compressed scalpulas. Um, Jesus. and just like completely messed my body up. Uh, so once they released the striker and I like I dropped down and they sent me to the medical system, um, that was kind of like, that was kind of it. Like, my shoulders were so messed yeah. up. I went from doing, 70, 80 pushups in a PT test to doing like nine because there was so much just crunching and grinding going through my shoulders. Uh, yeah. And I tried staying in. Um, I had a company commander that was really working with me getting body armor and, and I had cummerbund systems and, you know, letting me use like my waistband on ruck marches and stuff to keep the weight off. And finally there was a battalion commander that came down and like noticed I was doing different PTs than what the rest of the company was. And that was enough to put the nail mm-hmm. in the hammer. Yeah. So that started my med board and, um, and that was, that was pretty much it. You can't stop it after that. Mm -hmm. So what, what year was that roughly? Uh, I got injured in 2000 in, I want to say seven, I think. And then I ended Mm -hmm. up getting med boarded in August of 2008. Yeah. So what was that like transition like then? Like said, you're riding that high. Free act, freak accident happens. Now you're getting into the civilian world. Like where, where do you kind of, you know, navigate those waters? I mean, we, a lot of us have gone through that, you know, have a plan, don't have a plan, yeah. you know, good friends of mine, you know what I mean? Like I leaned on friends, you know, friends leaned on me, you know, how was that kind of getting out and, and getting into the, into the world, you know? Uh, to be honest, fucking terrible. Um, like to mm-hmm. be, just to be straight out honest, man. I mean, I was, I was married at the time, way too young and like also like injured, losing my career, going through a divorce, like getting kicked out of the military. Um, like everything that I didn't want was like, just like raining down on me within the same kind of month. And, uh, you know, I thought it was extremely terrifying because at the time frame, I was still like, you know, I was 23, 24. And, you know, I don't know what the hell to do with my life. Like, since I've been 18, mm-hmm. I've been told to slay people and go break people, mm-hmm. you know? So, like, that's, like, mm-hmm. what I've known throughout my whole entire career. And it doesn't exactly translate well to the civilian world unless you want to go do, yeah. like, contracting or something, right? Um, yep, yep. So, it, it kind of, like, they don't they just don't do a great job of preparing. They, and things may have changed now. Um, but for me, it was really hard. And, you know, trying to figure out if like, well, like what to do and what the purpose was like for two years, man, yeah. I rode a road bike around LA and like, that's all I did mm-hmm. down to San Diego, back up to LA, just all over California. And mm-hmm. just trying to find a purpose. And I think, um, I think it's something that having guys around you is a big importance. Like what you were saying, you know, I, mm-hmm. I think that started to become more of a normality that you're seeing as these years and the wars have gone on. Um, cause the mentality of where guys are like, Hey, you're a dude, like suck it up. Everything's great. That was, that was early 2000. And now you're seeing so many guys that are like, Hey man, like we're all dealing with this. Like we can, we can help like 
take my hand. Like you don't have to carry the load by yourself. And so I think that normality has helped a lot and it's helped me um, when I talk with my guys that are still in and uh, it helps me now that I've seen the way that I got out and people that have helped me, I try and do that with guys that are also either just going in and preparing themselves or getting out and preparing for a transition. That's going to be pretty hard. Yeah. 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 It's kind of crazy to talk about that now. I mean, so we're part of that, you know, you're a few years ahead of me, but we're part of that generation now where it is weird to think like your buddies are now their 20 years are done, you know, or they stayed in and like that time flies, like, you know, team leader I, like just, said, just retired. You know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I remember when I got out, I had a pretty solid plan. Like I, I was a con, I contracted. So immediately yeah. I was like, oh, I gotta go make this money. So I started throwing my resume in and I actually got picked up within like two months. I was back in Afghanistan, but yeah, it was, you know, and once you do that, that was kind of like a weird thing because there's a lot of like, you know, guys went to college and they're just like, fuck this. I can't do it. Uh-huh. They just call me. They're like, how did you get over? I saw, you know, on Facebook, I posted like, Hey, I'm going back to Afghanistan as a contractor or whatever. And so they would call me or text me like, I can't fucking do this anymore. Like, how did you do it? And I was like, I just submitted a resume. Here's the, here's here's the the email or here's the job board, you know? And then they would, and next thing I knew they're off and they're happier. You know, I think that, you know, at least in my, you know, that transition, like having that, like, it's like slowly stepping away. And, and, you know, that helped me a lot with my transition was actually going back. And then you are, you're surrounded by guys like us, you know, and you're making 15,000 a month, right. but you're, it's like that slow burn of kind of stepping away from the community. You know, you're still in it. You get the, you know, you don't have to report to a first sergeant making money, doing what you want, but you're still in the action, still over deployed. And, you know, but yeah, as time goes on though, you know, it, those opportunities aren't quite there. Like my brother is about to retire in the next two years. So, mm-hmm trying to make sure he's set up when he gets out, like it's just stuff that I've learned over the last 15 years, you know, it's, uh, it's important. Like, and I agree with you, you know, it was like back then that was just like the suck it up mentality, you know, and, and guys are having real issues. And even now, like, you know, I'm still, I'm getting now just like, like you said, I'm getting into the, into the veterans groups now as well, yeah. like with, uh, you know, foundations and whatnot and, and talking and, and helping, helping those guys out and, and whatnot. And then just in general with myself, you know, <clears throat> 15 years later. So no, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I think it was a, it was a pretty tough time. So you spent two years, you know, rolling around trying to find yourself. What, what kind of click that you're like, Hey, I'm going to, going to move forward with the next endeavor. Uh, you know, I had a, a girlfriend at the time who was just kind of pushing me into, uh, like, Hey, maybe you shouldn't spend like 400 miles a week on a bike and maybe you should go do like get a job. And I, I finally agreed with her and I started my, uh, job search out at a gun range called LAX firing range, uh, down right by, uh, LAX, uh, airport. Mm-hmm. And they're today, they're a big ammo company. It's called LAX ammo, LAX range. And that's where I started, um, doing range masters and just kind of, um, doing something to fill my time. And I actually contracted yeah. for, uh, I went out to global for a bit, but our visa never went through. Um, so once the visa canceled, I was like, maybe the, the shooting side of the house is something I'll stick into. Mm-hmm. And I just kept teaching classes. And finally a student was like, Hey man, like you're, you're pretty good with a pistol and a rifle. You should maybe look into like USPSA or three gun. And that really kind of, uh, started my funnel down that route. Um, I had never heard of it before and I went out and saw a three gun match, like actually get shot. And it was kind of just like the first hit of dopamine. Like, um, you know, that was like, okay, like this is, this is crazy. Like I, I'd done so much flat range stuff that when you see someone give you like an open ability to just go as fast as you can and accurately as you can, you know, it's like the first time you step into a race car and that really kind of like grabbed onto me for maybe eight to 10 years um, of just heavy, heavy competitively shooting. Um, And then that kind of opened the door into me saying, well, I should probably do a business, you know, something to like get my feet wet in the industry. And I started S3F, which was at the beginning was just selling product of companies I was shooting for. Um, and that mm-hmm. really kind of started me down the path of, of working inside of the industry. Mm-hmm. So what was your like main, you know, what was your best sellers and kind of like, how did you scale that? 
Uh, for me, the competitive shooting aspect was a big scale because um, I was able to talk to so many people across the nation and these corporations were willing to send me all over the place. And mm -hmm. we initially started it with just selling the products. And then one of our friends uh, at the time, he was working with a big machine shop um, out in Florida. Um, and we started partnering with them to develop a pistol barrel that was of more accurate uh, design, a tighter lock fit, but also still a drop in. And at the time, mm -hmm. the only companies that were really doing that were Lone Wolf, uh, Storm Lake, and kind of KKM. And then you had mm -hmm. Salient Arms, who I was shooting for at the time, came out with a gold barrel. And the gold barrel that Salient Arms came out with, I was noticing like just had tons of traction and they were selling this damn barrel for like $350. And all they were doing was taking an OEM barrel and plating it gold through PVD. And you know, that's like a $10 for a barrel, it's 50 bucks for a blank. I'm like you're taking, you're making mm -hmm. hundreds in profit. So I created, yeah. I created a company called S3F Solutions and we started doing the same exact thing, um, producing a match grade barrel and uh, doing them in like black, gold, rose gold, uh, doing all kinds of laser designs all over them. And within the first year and a mm -hmm. half, we broke 3 million. And so that, Ew, that's awesome. Yeah, it was yeah. really exciting. And so we kind of found a niche where we were like, oh man, like people really like this and they're looking for ways to increase their, you know, their accuracy or parts for their guns. And so it became something where for me, I was competitively shooting, shooting and I had Shane Coley from team Glock that was shooting from me and all these other guys under our, our belt. And then from there, there was no one making really a lot of barrels. So, you know, Blacklist was making barrels from us and Agency Arms was making barrels from us. And um, pretty much anyone that had a name at the time through like a six year span, if you saw a aftermarket barrel, well, it's only coming from two shops and most likely one of them's us. So that really mm -hmm. kind of helped us grow exponentially fast. Um, and we're still running today, but the priority for me is just not, it's not uh, pistol barrels anymore. Yeah. So you still the owner or do you have like a co-owner? How, how do you, how do you run it? No. So I'm still hundred percent owner. Um, this year we'll actually probably okay. be looking for either a buyout or, um, a partnership of some sort. Cause now Ukraine mm -hmm. and, and, uh, project leaflet and HHV and everything is taking so much of my time. Um, that the barrel side of the house is just kind of not as prioritized as it used to be. And there's a lot more competitors mm -hmm. in the market as well. Yeah. 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 So how did you kind of move? Uh, so like, we did talk about the exhibit and everything like that. So you did uh, the year and a half with, roughly with exhibit. And then so how did you get involved in with Hardhead Veterans? I mean, is that something like a mission that you were, since you already own this company, you know, S3F Solutions, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of made you shift over to be like, hey, I want to do stuff with Hardhead Veterans? Like what, what kind of got you into that? Uh, for me, it was um, I had just come off the sale of Napalm. And I moved back to Colorado and I was digging back in heavily with S3F again, which is what gave me a lot of the ability to support um, teams and units over in Ukraine because I had my own defense yeah. company. And so I could kind of handle certain things. Um, and then I, I started to want to do something a little bit more involved again. Um, you know, when you run a corporation, it it's super satisfying, but it also kind of takes your hand away from um, the, the people sometimes, I guess, you know, like I'll, I'll be yeah. so busy with like doing my taxes and spreadsheets and making sure my numbers are right or my margins are correct that I'm just not getting back to consumers or going out to all the events that I used to go to when I had a whole full staff. And so for me, it's kind of like SS S three F is my, my baby that runs out of my, you know, my facility and it's kind of self rotating and self turning. HHV, on the other hand, I'm I'm the community manager and events manager, so I'm constantly talking with uh, you know industry shooters and affiliates and pro teams and working with overseas guys and like their teams and going to different events. And to me, that is something that's pretty fulfilling when you get back in front of the consumer again and you can talk about a product that you know is physically going to save their life in a in a some type of per perspective. You know, pistol barrel doesn't necessarily do that. You know, you can put holes in people, but it's not going to necessarily, it's not going to stop a bullet from hitting you. Watching uh, all these guys that I'm providing helmets to 
and we take back in combat saves and you know i'm talking with these guys and communicating with them it's super rewarding to me yeah that's awesome so you got involved with them and then uh ukraine kicks off so what you know how do you said you already have some operators over did you have people over there before like that you're just talking to with hardhead mm-hmm. veteran you know that were shooting or, or even soft units and where they give you indication like hey this is going to pop off or shit's getting real tense right now yeah so before the invasion i've only been with with hardhead for about four months now so the this, this oh, is okay. a relatively new gig for me um the mm-hmm. ukraine stuff popped off when i was doing the when i was still heavily with s3f or that was a main focus okay. and I knew a lot of the guys, um, I, I guess I should reword that. I, I knew a fair amount of individuals that had pri- previously been fighting in Iraq um, that either I knew and served with or guys that once the Iraq war stopped, they stayed over and they fought with the Kurds. And mm-hmm. these were like personal friends and just guys that I had built relationships with over the years and followed their stories as well. And then as Ukraine started to pop off, they kind of rotated over. Um, and so I maintained relationships with them and the need of what they needed in Ukraine um, compared to what the accessibility and how things were running inside of Iraq with the Kurds was drastically different um, inside of the first few months. You know, there was a lot of uh, real worry that it was in fact only going to last a week and that, you know, they they weren't going to be able to hold, um, and that the training and gear that they were getting was not adequate. And, um, you know, people don't understand how like the, the gear goes over there and why certain teams are asking for donations compared to why Ukraine military is getting certain things. And, yeah. Once you understand how those actually work and gear is distributed, then you, you understand why certain teams are asking for um, handouts. And yeah, with me already having a defense network kind of set up inside of you, uh, the United States and having a, about a decade worth of relationships, I just decided to go to work. Um, and that was just a, yeah. like a, I guess like a brotherly love type thing. You know, like if one of your boys calls mm-hmm. you up and he's like, Hey man, like I'm, I'm in need, like, like I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. You know, that's, that's definitely what yeah, I'm going to do. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I mean, that was, a, that was a crazy thing too. When we, we went in, I think we were on ground within two and a half weeks after like uh March 16th, I think is when we stepped foot into, into Ukraine. Mm-hmm. So that was weird. Like it, it was like every day was like, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, that was, you know, they were gaining, they were, you know, Russians were gaining ground and losing ground. So yeah. there was like a good hope, but at the same time, it was like, we don't know how this is going to go. Maripol, they hadn't, it hadn't fallen yet, but it was looking like it was going to fall, you know, I mean, or it was just, a, just a brutal battle, you know, and then as well as like kind of in the North and Kiev and, you know, all that, all, you know, Cherniv and it, it was, it was crazy. It was a crazy time, you know? And so, yeah, being on ground, we always had, like, I had a backpack. <laughs> it was like, all right, well, if this goes sideways, we're grabbing this thing. We're heading to the border, you know, yeah. like if they, you yeah, know, it's, it's, depending the on what The first what couple months were weird, man. But, you know, Nick, like yeah. I was talking to you about Nick and Nick was, and I were talking, yeah. um, we literally had dudes on day one that were sending us messages and calling us and they're like, it's fucking happening like right now. And like, even before news yeah. agencies or anything were going on and like, we had guys holding their phones up and you could hear helicopters like coming over and you like, yeah. you knew you're like, okay, this is not good. Like it's, it's for sure an invasion. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Just yeah. so, so was project leaflet b- uh, existed before that or no. was that something that came about? Yeah. yeah so project leaflet uh, with you, like kind of started as, um, I was, I, those re- those requests started like coming in and funneling in pretty heavily and i started mm-hmm. using s3f as a means to uh funnel pr- uh, product with um non and with other organizations that could get them into like last mile deliveries mm-hmm. um started working with a lot of medical mm-hmm. units and um also with a lot of direct action units and those relationships mm-hmm. started building into like like hey man check out this awesome footage i've got and or like hey dude check out this story that of a drone that was following us and so we started documenting or i guess i i started documenting a lot of that on my personal page of of blood and steel 
and for like the first three or four months of the war, like nonstop. I mean, I, I was so heavily addicted and, and committed into it. Um, it pissed off my wife, like a, a very good amount. <laughs> and so I, I figured yeah. if I'm going to do this and, you know, like have a reason for her not to be pissed off, uh, then I need to create something out of it. And that was kind of where Project yeah. Leaflet formed um, and really kind of took off with popularity of just doing a lot of uh, open source intelligence, um, doing a lot of informational and maps, um, telling what's going on on the day to day mm -hmm. basis, and then also putting in a lot of footage that we were getting shared from a lot of these troops. Um, and that gave a really mm -hmm. good firsthand experience for people to see truly like what is going on on the ground and the information that should be told to the people when they actually turn on their TV and they're not fed any of that type of information of why this war is going on. Um, and that's, that's kind of where Leaflet started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so do you get, so do you have someone that's curious? Like, I know you, you know, guys are sending you footage and whatnot, but do you have like someone else? Like, you know, like I said, that sounds like a lot, a lot of stuff. When I talk with Nick, he's, he's running a solo team. So when he posts as much as he does, I was like, Oh, wow. You have oh, time for that, you know, and, and, and interviewing and all that stuff and, and whatnot. But are you running that solo or do you have someone that's like said, creating these little Intel briefs slash updates and whatnot no, I'm solo. Uh, with project leaflet? Yeah. Nick and I are solo. Solo. So like, I'd love to have more yeah. help. Yeah, um, so, yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. uh, I definitely dedicate a lot of hours each day. Um, so like if I go take a mm -hmm. shit, I'm usually on, I'm on, I'm doing my phone stuff. If I'm, my wife goes to bed, like, uh, I'm up for a couple hours afterwards and I'm just digging in with all my maps, all my telegrams, mm -hmm. like, and just, uh, feeding in, um, mm -hmm. you know, and the other thing is like, there's a time difference too. So if I want to actually continue to get this type of information and talk with these guys and stories, sometimes I have to be up at two in the morning. Um, cause in Ukraine, it, it's such a different time swap that it, getting access to some of these guys sometimes is really difficult and I don't want to pull them off what their primary, yeah. you know, focus is. Um, so, you, you know, for me, I, I'm just blessed to be able to bear witness on some of this and, you know, mm -hmm. have a small piece or a small cog of the whole puzzle. Um, and that, that's something that I think is super important to me because there's so many guys that are doing so many incredible feats of, of bravery. But, you know, for us, if it's not a medal of honor or a silver star with acorn, you're not going to hear about it. And so I think that's where Nick and I mm -hmm. kind of, we see very eye to eye um, because we know that it's like, we just want, we want these stories to get out and we want people to understand what these guys are going through because none of us have experienced this. You know, this is such a different war than any of us have seen. Yeah. And I think that's, that's always kind of comes down to it is like, this is, you know, we fought the counterinsurgency for 20 years, you know, and very few times have people, you know, encountered what's going on, you know, within the trenches or with that, you know, that kind of warfare going on in Ukraine, you know, if not at all. So it, yeah, it's amazing seeing you guys capture all these stories and, you know, and is that something that you're going to keep moving on? I mean, with Ukraine, it feels like there definitely is going to be an end, you know, do you plan on kind of shifting gears then towards something different? Like I know Nick does a lot of historical yes. and whatnot and, and, and other wars. Do you, you think about like, I know things are popping off. I'm just saying, so, you know, like Sudan's kicking off right now and, and you know, Africa is always like a, a hotbed for stuff is, you know, kind of like some of these other Intel accounts, are you going to be kind of pursuing that after Ukraine or, you know, or, you know, shifting in that direction? You know, I think that's, um, I think that's the goal. When Nick and I talk with each other, we, we kind of have an, we bounce off of each other really well, right? Like Nick captures a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really like to do the instruction and I like to get as far front as I can, you know, to capture photography. Mm -hmm. Um, so some of the things he mm -hmm. doesn't like to do, I like to do. And some of the things that I don't like to do, he likes to do. But because of that, yeah. we've also outlined like a lot of countries that we really would like to go back to or go to in case something does happen. Um, and I always say, I'm like, Hey man, I have, cam I have camera will embed. Um, you know, if like, you're going to give me the option to go back to Mazul and go talk with some of the guys I fought with, dude, let's go. You know, I think it's, that, that's, yeah. uh, what a war photographer kind of does. Um, you know, now if you give me the option to go to Russia, mm -hmm. 
I, that might be something I pass on a little bit for right now. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I have a Ukrainian stamp. Yeah. Like, I don't think I, I would love to go to Russia, but I was like, I don't see myself going there in the next 10 years. Yeah, I think that yeah. might be a little, you know, I, maybe a little harsh. I, you and know? I have guys on yeah. my Instagram page that are like, oh, dude, you should embed in Russia. I've got units. They'll, they'll let you come in. And I'm like, I've got an MOD accredited pass with Ukraine. I'm going to fucking die. <laughs> like, I, I know it. <laughs> like, Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a terrible yeah. idea. <laughs> like, it, you know, I'm one to go do some fun, crazy shit, but heading into Russia in, in any not capacity right now. right now is, I not think, right a suicide now. mission. Yeah, yeah, that's not a, that's not a good but play. I'd like to. No, you know, I agree. I definitely do. I know the Ukraine thing can't yeah. last for forever. Um, you know, I like fucking mm -hmm. knock on wood, right? I mean, uh, there yeah, has to be yeah, a give exactly. or take there at some point in some way. And so, you know, lining up connections and, and relationships with a lot of other people is, is super important. You know, we work with, a, I, I talk with a couple of SOF guys that are down in um, Kenya that want us to come down there and like do interviews with them. Uh, and they're fighting a bunch of ISIS guys down there. Um, I've talked with a couple ISOF dudes that are back in Iraq that are still holding on and putting on the good fight up mm -hmm. in Missoula and a few other areas. You know, I'd love to go in bed with them. Because mm -hmm. um, I think some of these stories yeah. where you're finding little pockets of just like such high level and insane bravery that these people should be talked mm -hmm. on. You know, it's it, you're, yeah, I just absolutely. think they should be like paraded and, and, and spoke on. And I think there's so many areas that you mm -hmm. can go to. I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's crazy because, because too, in our culture, you know, like it's, like I said, I love what you guys are doing and like social media has kind of created that. I mean, even with like Nick, when I kind of discovered his account and then a lot of these accounts that kind of popped up after the Afghani vac, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel like a lot of people kind of got their mm -hmm. jump start with that. Like basically disseminate information as fast as you could because everything was changing on the ground oh, so quickly. quickly, or at least that's when I noticed it. A lot of the, the, the news accounts, you know, Intel accounts, however you want to say it, you know, um, but they're getting stuff out there. And then it's like these small nuggets of stories that are recording history. And I've told Nick this and I and, and definitely tell you too, what you guys are doing is actually probably one of the greatest things for history because we don't have these type of stories in little nuggets in these areas, you know, because everyone wants to write a book or it's got to be a, a fucking, you know, a 300 page novel of a unit. And then you, you, you know, then they kind of have some stories here and there where it's like, these guys have done these amazing, crazy things. And now it's documented and it's now, you know, it's part of history. You know, we don't have a ton of those, you know, some of the units that Nick was talking about in like World War, just World War II, Vietnam, you know, not everybody writes a book, not anybody wants to talk about it. But, you know, even the stuff of like, you know, the opposing forces, like the Nazis or the Japanese or the mm -hmm. NBA, you know, like getting their perspective, the Chechnyans, like, it's crazy to hear their stories and document that because nobody wants to document that, you know, it's like, it, but at the same time, even on their side, if they're fighting us or fighting another army, like there's still bravery that's there, yeah, of course. you know, there's still that brotherhood and recording that type of history is still, it's incredibly important. And so you guys, you know, recording this history, I think it's probably one of the, you know, I think it's, I don't want to say it's overseen because I think it's very big on social or not big on social media, but you know, it's like definitely living out on social media, but even in print form, like with those volumes coming yeah. out, it's just like, Holy shit. Like here's stories from the Chechen war. And it's not, it's not like, Oh my God, I got to fucking suffer through this guy, how he grew up and his parents, you know, it's like every, you know, not, not to go down. There's nothing wrong with guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, you know, even in the U S you know, like guys are like writing the books, like, do you need to write a book? You know, right. like, do we really care, you know, where you came from? Like, it, it's okay. Like, I think it's great. Some of those guys do. And, 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 you know, they have success with yeah, that. Yeah, but we all make have, jokes. Every you know, Navy SEAL uh, has their own book about, out, right? It's like, like, yeah, exactly. Like, like, I don't, I'm, I'm sick and tired of hearing buds. I couldn't give two shits about buds anymore. It's more, it's like, it's insane. Like, I don't care. You know, that's how much it's just talked about. Like, no one gives a shit. And, and that's what I mean. Like they, it's, and then it's like one or two incidents. Whereas like here you guys are capturing, you know, the heroism that's happening on the, the, the Ukrainian front, which by the way is it's nuts. You know, this is full on modern trench warfare, modern, you know, urban warfare and modern uh, conventional warfare happening all at the same time, you know, and ironically the air war is the one that's not 
you know, because technology has progressed right. so much <laughs> that the air war, I don't want to say it's not existent, but close to it really puts things into perspective. And I, yeah. And I even said it too with my buddy. I'm like, look, man, like, you know, you can be a hard hitting, whatever tier one operator these days, but you're, you're, you're just as useful as the guy, actually the, the grunt in the trench is more useful right now because you're not going to get landed on the X with a fucking little bird. Cause they'll shoot that right out of the sky. No one's coming for you. You know, like you don't have the logistics systems. It's all gone. Like, you know, not saying against the training or any that, you know, tier one units are soft or whatever, but you know, it's one of those things that's like really puts things into perspective on what's important. And it still comes back to uh-huh. infantry tactics, you know, <clears throat> trench warfare, and then just, you know, warfare 101, you know, you, you, you get, you take away all the assets, it's fucking bare knuckle fucking duking it out, you know? And, um, I think what you guys are recording is, is phenomenal and, and putting that out there for the world, you know, and, and like I said, I think it's important to history because, you know, as we move forward, we're all these stories you guys are collecting are 100% will translate into, you know, modern warfare books or, you know, into history being like, this is how they fought it. This is what worked. This is what didn't, you know, like I said, you, you even talked with uh, Marine Corps EOD. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Yeah. I know, you know, some of it might be some sensitive information, but you know, what you've already done should be being talked to, to our forces. Cause it's like, you better fucking get ready because I think what a lot of assets you think you're going to have on ground, you will not have, you yeah. know, so get used to get, better, get good at that compass, <laughs> you know, and some iron yeah, sights. You know, and that's a huge <laughs> so. conversation. And I think, um, it's a big focus of mine and where I want to take project leaflet. You know, Nick is still very heavy on the, mm-hmm. on the story side of things. And I think that's such an important aspect to do it. Um, for me, it's, it's an important aspect that we're understanding what is happening right now. Like in this in this time frame inside of Ukraine, what is changing and what are we not doing to pay attention to it? And so for me, I've been trying to conduct um, I, I build out entire presentations and then I go and I ask, like, hey, if you're willing to fly me out, um, I'll I'll spend a day with your entire unit. As many guys as you want to bring in, I can bring in samples. Um, I'll do a presentation and let's talk about drone technology and things of what we're used to, what we're doing and how how very incorrect it's going to be in the near future um and you know Mm -hmm. the marines for an example are looking at at putting a drone operator on every single one of their squads um but even the way that they Mm -hmm. are conducting or looking at how the structure of that would be is still very you know they put a lot big big army big marine doesn't put a lot of trust in the ground troop Meaning like, you know, your, your, yeah. your Lance Corporal or your specialist or whatever, sure, they've got responsibilities, but not like a, an E5, E6 inside of small teams, you know, who has a lot more freedom and, yeah. and trust and responsibility to go and do something and have the integrity to not fuck up. And so the problem that we're mm-hmm. seeing is that, you know, when I went and spoke with the Marines, they, I started to talk off with like, this is what we're used to, like Global Hawks and Predators and some smaller systems Mm -hmm. but you know those are great but when you have ten thousand dgis flying in a country dropping hand grenades off of them that's going to be a lot more successful than 300 predators with missiles on their wings it's just it's all war of attrition that's going on in ukraine right now and when we did the first Mm -hmm. presentation with eod there was a lot of gasps and a lot of like oh my fucking god um no, we, we did yeah. a video, party. which is so or wild. Go yeah. Go ahead. Um, go, ahead we, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I think it's just, it's just so wild because it's playing out real time yeah. and, and nothing against our, you know, the, the, the guys on the ground, but it's like, you need to be paying attention to this. Like this isn't a political, you know, statement or whatever with Ukraine. Like you need to be looking at what's going on in the ground. Like, like I was there, we follow these people. I talked to people like you and Nick, you know, and I talk to commanders on the ground, you know, I'm kind of, you know, and, and just kind of always keep my, you know, ear to the ground, what's going on, how's this working? And he's right away. You're like, this is like every single Marine, 
like infantrymen and EOD operators should be following on their Instagram every fucking day. Yep. Like it sounds weird to say that, but it's like every morning, what'd you guys find? Yeah. Like what'd you, what were you, when you scroll and watching, you know, love is blind last night on Netflix. Like what, what did you find, you know, with your wife? Like it, it's like, you, there's so much information. And the fact we that there was gas is like, you guys are behind the fucking all able. Yeah. Like, it's open source. Find yeah. All, this of this isn't, all over the internet. Yeah, exactly. It just, it blows my mind. Yeah, and like, yeah. even when I spoke with the lieutenants there, you know, I'm saying like, look, if you're not using a cell phone, you're, you're going to f- probably fucking die. Like you need to start implementing this into your, your system. And the Marines are looking at me like I'm an idiot yeah. and I'm like, okay, let me, let me give you a perfect yeah. example. And so like this, this got shared to me today, um, which is a little photo of a, it's a drone imagery looking over the top of the tank. And, but I wanted to mm-hmm. read it because I read it to the lieutenants and they're like, well, we have to use everything encrypted. Everything has to not, has to be off cell phone. And I said, well, this is an imagery that shows a drone operator that has his drone um, actually, uh, his drone is actually jammed by Russian forces, which he put in like a little arrow up there. And so what the units did on the ground and the drone operators did with the guys fighting was that they used Signal and they used Discord to do communication comms between drone pilot and then did live stream on discord to see what the drones were looking at. And they did uh, uh, GPS mortar correction, artillery correction and troop movement over discord and signal. So tell me why the fuck do I need encrypted? Because you yeah. can't go into signal anyways. It's, it's yeah. Like yeah. No, I agree fast. with that. And that's the same. We, we were using signal. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. That's moving too fast. And that's something that again, uh, we can talk offline a little bit, but after this, but we've been talking with some entities too with the UAV stuff, and it's still always that weird disconnect between the higher and the and the produce, you know, the product maker, the producers, the, st- the the strategists, and then the guys on the ground. Like I've already talked to a few people as well. I was like you don't under- like I was like you can do all the cool shit you want, or you want to have all the features. It does not matter because you're going to give it to the hands of a 19 year old, and it's not going to work, or it's not feasible, or it's or what doesn't matter because. The DJI drone is going to be more effective because I can go buy on eBay right now, buy a three hundred dollar component to drop a grenade, and now suddenly I'm over there dropping twenty grenades a day. Oh, more you know, than that, I was having one of the sergeant majors in the ground. 20, yeah, twenty to yeah, forty. He said twenty yep. to forty, and they were getting effective kills, and that's, that's one, one guy. guy. That, yeah, and that's yeah. I mean, I put that in my presentation. That, yeah, I mean, how can you? Like, yeah, how can you avoid that? How can you ignore that? I, I don't know. Like it's like it's it's. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's like if you do simple math, they're, like they're, they're estimating that over 10,000 DJI, DJI drones are in Ukraine. Like that's an estimation. So there's probably more. Now, if you have, let's just say that yeah. on a good day, those drones are running an estimate of 40 to 50 missions a day, dropping one to two grenades per drone. If let's just say we do everything great and every drone's running on the one day doing 50 grenade drops, it's 400 fucking thousand grenades dropping per day. I don't know how to, yeah, I don't know exactly. how to stop that. Yeah. And it's accurate. Yeah. 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 It's accurate. It's fast. And it's, it's easy. And on top of that too, like your, your predators, you always like put money into all these systems. And I was a contractor, you know, like, and I saw that stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, when I was uh, in the Marine Corps seeing contractors in Iraq and then Afghanistan, I was a, you know, as, as a Marine and then as a contractor and you see the waste, you see the bullshit that the military buys and that worked in the counterinsurgency, right. you know, they're like, yeah, whatever, you know, you're, you know, you're fighting guys up in the mountains, whatever you see the disconnect, some things work, some don't, but now there's, it's like real shit's on the line here and stuff is not working and they're not going to use it if it doesn't work, you know? And, and like I said, the wild part is, is like, you're not seeing crazy air to air battles. Like, F-22 Raptors and, you know, it, it's great. You're spending a billion dollars on it. But what happens when, it, when a, you know, some dipshit Russian or, Ch- you know, Chinese dude takes it out with a service their missile? Like it's never been tested against a real conventional enemy, you know, and how low can it get? What are you doing dog fights? Like it's all in theory for the last 20 years. And then Ukraine kicks off. It's the most closest we'll ever get yep. to right now as a conventional warfare the only other people that that can come up we we know that we can take on russia but china is still another beast you know like the technology they have i know is no is way better than 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 russia's so what happens if something goes they go toe-to-toe with somebody that we're supporting right. you know and it, so it is a it is a wild conversation to have and so what was the you said there was a lot of gasps like did they 
absorb it that some of these lieutenants or all these, you know, guys or operators or the EOD guys kind of be like, oh shit, we need to start really thinking. I about think what's they going absorbed on. it. Uh, one of the big, one of the videos I put in that really kind of um, made them ask a lot of questions was seeing FPV detonation drones. Uh, you know, they yeah. they weren't they weren't as used to seeing that type of tech. Like they had seen some of the drones dropping grenades and uh, things like that, but they had never really kind of seen, I guess the race drone style with packed explosives using like a cross wire in the front of it. And then as soon as the wires touch a detonates yeah. and I put a video up yeah. and I said, you know, this is something that we need to be paying attention to because of exact reasons like this. And it was an FPV drone yep. that takes off. A T-72 is driving down the road. And you see the hatch yep, open just barely where the tank commander's head. And that drone pilot runs it right into the tank commander's head. And you're talking yep. about a moving drone, a moving tank, and a fucking precise munition that essentially just put that whole entire tank out of action for probably a $2,000 ticket. And, you know, oh, yeah. $6 million out of a T-72, yep. $3 million? somewhere around there you do it enough it's very expensive yep yep absolutely and that egg like i said that was uh you know i've been in drones since film oh, school yeah. so i got it and i got my first dji back in 2015 and this was something that was funny because me and a buddy of mine actually tried to pitch into the cia back in 2017 so a bit of the stuff that's all happening now and they just kind of brushed it off or whatever you know <clears throat> and we were trying to do security but then you know fpv stuff as well and we're like hey you know this is a capability do you guys want to fund this and they're like Fuck, whatever you know we actually got sat down with you know with them and, and whatnot and i wasn't expecting much but now you're seeing that and you like said that's maybe a two thousand dollar drone tops that just took out an entire tank also the you know counter uav measures you know like nothing. what do you have nothing you know nothing because are you going to put up your own bubble are you going to you going to try to spend more money on this well that cost you know what i mean like if somebody doesn't do the right thing suddenly the encryption is no good i mean how many times i know even in afghanistan crypto rollover fucked up a yeah. whole operation you couldn't talk to air but you could talk to ground units so now suddenly I have two cryptos. I literally have one radio with the old crypto, one radio with the new crypto because the dipshit team, sister team we had, uh, you know, wasn't doing the right thing on their op board or, and then fucked up and they put an operation right in the middle of a crypto changeover. So now everyone's running around, can't, you know, some people can talk to, to air, some can, you know, and that, that's the fog of war, but. And you're seeing how fast these things develop, you know, in, in the UAV and it's taking out, you know, those videos that you and you and uh, that Nick post is just like, it's incredibly eye opening. And that's just one aspect yeah, that's just two of this war is going on. You know, we're, we're never going to yeah, see all yeah. the footage and information come out of this war. You know, we've, we've seen all the footage that we can see out of World War II. We've probably seen all the footage out of Vietnam, probably all mm -hmm. the footage out of Korea. But Ukraine, man. Mm -hmm. Every flying dude's got a GoPro on his helmet. Everyone's got a camera in their hand. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got a cell phone. There's drones flying everywhere, and everything's recorded. So, you know, yeah. there, there's multiple pages, but even if I'm spending four hours a day or five hours a day documenting and talking with all these guys and trying to pull footage, I'm missing so much because there's just going to be so much footage for decades to come of actions that has been recorded that we have not seen. It, it's it's very hard to yeah, capture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those guys that you kind of you know were they pretty open to what's going on with the Marines and then do you have any you know were they like hey yeah, we need to take this up the chain because I remember seeing when the drone warfare last year they were like oh drone warfare and then they they showed some video at like I can't remember yeah. NTC and they're showing like bigger you know and I'm like you're still not getting the point you know it's like the army was like oh shit let's buy some yeah, drones right. you know and then and then do this weird implementation on these giant effects you know like or giant exercises and it still feels clunky you know and all this other stuff have, you know where they they were obviously pretty receptive to it but you know where these guys kind of like we need you know talking to you or they're like hey we need to can, you know can you come back yeah. how do how can we implement what can we do like, so i had about you know, 52 marines that were inside of my talk um some of them were definitely all yeah. the way up to just under colonel um most of them were high level like ncos um squad team platoon mm -hmm. company and then officers as well and you know i th I think a lot of guys took it as an eye-opening experience. Um, I'm 
hopeful that I'll be able to have more conversations with other uh, Marines that come through that organization. Um, I actually had Marsoc mm -hmm. that reached out the same week that heard I was on base doing the presentation and wanted me to come back. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that this will start to be something where it's like, you know, hey, this is where we're at and this is where we thought we need to be. But now, like, myself and other individuals are saying, hey, man, like, you're on the right road, but you need to take a right here or take a left there um, because mm -hmm. we always focus so much on control, um, especially control over the younger troop. And I, I think personally, mm -hmm. the way that the, the drone operator needs to fall is almost like how the SDM program fell in the, in the army, you know, the striker started the mm -hmm. SDM program and the SDM program ended up being on almost every squad or every team throughout the entire army. And so why can't we do that with a young operator that is going through pilot school, that understands his drones, that works on a squad, on a team or squad level, you know, take one of those riflemen in the army that just sitting there doing nothing and make him a drone operator and then give him the access yeah, to yeah. 3D printing and like let creativity take over, you know, because they're, they're, the way yeah. that Ukraine is seeing this and the way that we tend to look at our drone technology is so much so much big level or high level um big drones and stealth and doing all this great stuff and they have the they have a purpose you know the those big drones do have a purpose mm -hmm. but we're they're going to mm -hmm. be overwhelmed by the small drones that are coming in on a personal level that are doing you think about it man a drone operator in ukraine can act as a forward observer a recon a medical casualty point collection dude that that gives gps points on injured troops he's a grenadier i mm -hmm. mean like what what doesn't this guy fill in a role now and you're getting it all out of one yeah. individual guy so that type yeah. of aspect or view of what this individual brings now to a team has to be looked at in in our militaries Otherwise, we're going to get screwed because it, there's too much information yeah. the way that a drone operator implements um, their job now and gives information to the team, the squad, the platoon and the company commander all through one guy, yeah. you know, and Ukraine's putting them on yeah. everyone. Medical dudes are drones. EODs are drones like frontline troops are drones. Mm -hmm. Grenadiers are drones. Arty guys are drones. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I'm like screaming it at mm -hmm. the top of the mountain. And I'm just like hoping that, you know, one of these big. Multi, like multi-cam ships or the hard pack ships is going to yeah, like yeah. slowly start making adjustments. You're like, come on guys. <laughs> well, it's so wild too. Cause I mean, it's just like, I remember when they came out and the first Mavics came out and I was like, Oh my God, I would have used this in a heartbeat. And I, you know, and, they, and troops did in, in, in Afghanistan mm -hmm. for a few years. And then they I think back in like, I think like 18 or 19, they were kind of like, Hey, stop using the DJI drones or whatever. And, but I, we, I, w I was in the guard national guard and, um, <clears throat> after my Marine Corps stint and, uh, I did a trip to Kuwait, you know, but we thought we might go to Afghanistan. And so like, I was, you know, this was back in 2018, 2019. And I was like, I'm absolutely getting a thermal Mavic, to stick in my pack and we're taking that. I don't care what the U S are like, what the regulations are. I don't, are you kidding me? Like China can have the fucking data. I don't right. give a shit, you yeah. know, especially at that point, you know, I was like, are you like to be able to, f and I was a drone operator already for, for cinematography. I was like, these are phenomenal. Dude, it's a huge, it's like a the huge fact that we can get over to the team. Like, like you're, you're, a half a mile away just, with I've optics, never understood check how out the roads. Can... We could, we got thermals in these little guys now. We can maybe see if there's a, a, a you know, an IED yep. or something that's at least dug up. Like the, the, you, there's so much implementation. Like, you know, at that time, I don't think they had grids on some of them. You know, I think some other ones did, but like, yeah, some other drones, you could absolutely get a grid and now we can call it yep. a fire mission, you know, from our position. Like it's a whole, it's, it's, it was amazing. And then <clears throat> <clears throat> flash forward to, so to you know, now, point, like, like what you're like, saying wow. on adjustment of fire missions, yeah. guys are using those very heavily with Mark 19 platforms in Ukraine. You know, they'll, they'll put a Mark mm. 19 on the back of a truck and they'll take the truck off. They'll fire two rounds with the drone up see where they they drop and mm -hmm. they make their adjustments right on the fly they don't have to wait for an fo they don't have to That's wait awesome. for anyone they just yeah. fire two see where they drop fire two yes. see where they drop send it all yep that's awesome. And it's funny too, because I remember they talked about the Mark 19 being yep. an indirect fire weapon. And it's like, you know, in the Marine Corps, you're like, yeah, okay. You know, they, they kind of demonstrated it. Like, it was like, when am I ever going to use this? You know, <laughs> you know, at least like in my capacity, I was like, when, but now you're, you know, you're, you're seeing Ukraine. It's like, yeah, we are our own oh, artillery yeah. unit now. We shoot 
Mark 19, we direct, we FO, and it, we're super effective. We don't even need more. You're not saying mortars are great, but it's like how fast is a Mark right. 19? You can make it indirect, and then suddenly it's a yeah, – I love the Mark 19. I thought it was it, an amazing – It's a great platform, we loved it and especially for trench warfare. It's a great platform. It's seeing a lot of success in Ukraine oh, yeah. because you're getting a good high arc <laughs> level. The distance doesn't necessarily have to go too far. And if you have a, a drone over the top, yep. you can see them dir- directly drop into where you want, make adjustments – and a belt of yep. 20 or 40, man, goes mm-hmm. off real quick. Yep, exactly. And you're turning and burning, like, and they come, you know, and like you light up a house, oh, yeah. that thing will tear it down. Like, it's just, it's amazing. It's a phenomenal weapon. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's crazy because it's like, we've talked about this for years. And even when I was in the Marine Corps, it's like, you don't know how anything works until you get on the ground. And then suddenly tactics just change, you know? And I think a lot of people have struggled with that sometimes that, have never quite been in combat, mm-hmm. you know, or they are, but they're, you know, you know, nothing against, you know, admins or people that were in Al Assad for a long time or yeah, they did fluid Iraq, but you hung out at the MWR and like nothing wrong with that. But it's like when guys like us were on the ground, we're like this doesn't work, this does work. And then sometimes people were like, well, that's stupid. I was like, well, I don't know what to yeah. tell you. It fucking works. And they're like, well, this is an amazing thing. I was like, well, that doesn't work. You know why? Cause we didn't use it. It's stupid. They're like, well, it should. It it's like, well, it yeah. doesn't like, I just can't, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, we can't implement it. And you sometimes at the end of the day, just keep it simple, 100%. stupid, you know? And, and that's, that's, that's so wild about technology now is like everything you always see those, you know, you know, money and things getting blown on these bigger and bigger projects. It's like, even with me with the F 22, I'm like, I'm sure it's great. But I was like, we could use one of those costs of, you know, down on the ground. Like we need better optics. We need better this, we need better that. It's not, you know, it's always that weird issue of funding and, and whatnot, but so you guys actually went over though to Ukraine, correct? Yeah. You and Nick, yeah, you guys just, linked we, up. Uh, we got to yeah. know each so other was really well and like decided it. to make a trip over together. Mm-hmm. What uh, what month was, or when did you guys go? When was uh, uh, when we was went that time for last? It? I think it was last November. Uh, yeah, November. Yeah, yeah, I remember Nick talking about that. And so how was that? Was that kind of eye opening for you guys? How was your trip over? Like, kind of seeing you know six eight months. Uh, of the for me, I was pretty excited about it. I think Nick was a little more nervous. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Nick doesn't have a lot of combat experience, um, and I've got a fair amount of combat mm-hmm. experience. So it, we kind of balanced each other off of that because I could be, I, I like wanted to go like way more dangerous areas than where Nick wanted to go. And so, you know, he kind (laughs) of also kept me like a little bit more reined back. And um, I also kind of like pushed him a little bit. Um, So I think, Mm -hmm. you know, like we we do really well together. And for Ukraine, you know, the first trip over was kind of like, I don't, man, I don't know what I'm doing. Like he he didn't know what he was doing. Like we we literally Mm -hmm. like put this plan together within a month and we're, because we had been doing so many story capturing that we're like, if we don't go, then like, what are we doing? Like, kind of like, you know, we're kind of anyone Mm -hmm. else that's just pulling information. But if we're capturing these stories from people and giving and supplying gear, then I felt like we needed to go there. You know, I, I need to go, I need to go see these people in their face, in their eyes and talk to them. And Mm -hmm. it's such a different relationship. Um, you know, it's, and you get a lot more respect, I feel like out of the, out of your stories and, and your endeavors when you, when you're taking the time to sit down there and put yourself in their shoes. Um, so for Ukraine, it was, it was a, it was a wild ride to see the amount of destruction. I, I think that was the first thing that really kind of took me back. Um, you know, I'd seen Mazul and, and other towns that had been through big bombardments, um, from like, you know, precision strikes and things like that. Uh, but nothing to this mm-hmm. level, you know, where it's like, co- I mean, complete, yeah. just like wiped off. Like that yeah. was a town, like that was a town and you can tell it kind of that it was a town, but it's just like such, such destruction and death that's over there. Um, is really, I think mm-hmm. kind of hard to take in sometimes. Um, you know, like the class that I had the ability to train with, um, I think we had half the class had just come back from Bakhmut. Um, and so it was like kind of their reward mm-hmm. that they get an advanced training. And then the, and they were the ones that survived their rotation in Bakhmut. And then the other half were guys mm-hmm. that had just enlisted and they had a month to train up uh, with our unit before they went out to Bakhmut. 
you know, and that's like KA-52 mm-hmm. attack helicopters, fucking tanks, rolling artillery. Like, I'm not even talking infantry. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you watch these guys mm-hmm. go down from their great, their parade field and you're like, fuck, man, if, if a quarter comes back like that, that'll be nice. You know, I'd like to see some of their faces. Um, yeah. And so that I think is, is mm-hmm. it was a little bit harder for me to kind of, um, to, to put your, it's just hard, man. Like you, cause you know, you're looking at people compared to like the Iraq or Afghanistan war where we lost 9,000 guys and, you know, out of 20 years of, of warfare. And if you go do missions, like, you know, you, you know, you trust the dudes next to you and that there's a good, good chance they're going to make it through their entire deployment. You know, Ukraine, if they make it through mm-hmm. a couple weeks in Bakhmut, you know, Bakhmut's got a four hour lifespan expectation. It's like, it's, yeah. it's and, um, I, I think another big thing for me was the takeaway that I've, I've trained with INGs and I've seen the ANA mm-hmm. and, um, the will power and like the will to fight from the Ukrainians was something that really was a take back for me from when I looked at in training with ING and getting these people to kind of like do anything was, you know, a struggle. Mm -hmm. Um, You spend time with some of these Ukrainian guys that were glass makers and tire repairmen. And they're literally like begging me like, Hey man, teach me like, will you stay for another hour? Like show me and I will mimic your moves. Yeah. Like I, I need to know this. And that yeah. that's a really refreshing aspect too, from when 20 years of just like trying to teach people to defend their land and no one seems to give a fuck. And you come over here yeah. for a little bit and these people are like, like viciously asking to be taught and like are willing to mm-hmm. like stay out longer and be in the cold. And so that was really refreshing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the civilian population for me was a really hard thing to view because you have so many people that Mm -hmm. are just so poor um, and they've been put into this type of position now that they have no place to go. And, you know, they're living in these massively bombed out centers and cities that are still under conflict. And they're just like, well, like, like, where where do you want me to go? And how do you want me to get there? Because, you know, my, I live here, my, Babushka lives across the street. My grandmother lives right down this road. And like, we're like, where do you, where do you want me to go? You know? And it's, so it's, that was such yeah. a weird aspect to where you'd see this town had, you know, tens of thousands of arty rounds dropped on it and there's still civilians living in it. Uh, so it's, it, it's just, yeah, it's a weird, um, it's hard to put into words, uh, the amount of like destruction, man. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really, um, it's really hard to see, uh, you, you know, you just, yeah, you know, it's just hard to see. So you guys, uh, I know Nick is planning on a trip back. Are you going to kind of go back with him or what you got any plans? So Nick to, is to definitely planning on a trip back. Um, mine is kind of contingent on what HHV will let me do. Um, they've been open to allowing me to go back. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, um, hoping to go back there later on if I can get a trip back this year around November. Um, that might be my same goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause right now HHV has a couple thousand helmets that are in Ukraine. And so we're, we're really wanting to like mm-hmm. talk with guys and then, um, and just get their feedback and personal opinions on like, Hey, like, what do you, like, what do you enjoy from us? Like, have you liked the product? And, um, now we've actually had a lot of guys reach yeah. out to us because, uh, we've had a lot of combat saves. And so we do, a uh, we do a, a program where if you get injured in, um, in, in the line of fire or in, in your job or duty and your, your product is destroyed. Um, if you send it back to us, we'll exchange it for free. And so we had a guy that actually sent us a helmet mm-hmm. a couple months ago. His name's, uh, uh, one Jedi on Instagram. And he took an ATGM round a meter over his head, uh, and it detonated and the helmet sta- mm-hmm. stayed together and kept him alive. And so now it's in our office and like, we've got a, we've got Jeez. it in a glass case and like, um, you know, that to me is like such a cool experience say, yeah. to be able to, now it's like, it's come full circle, right? Like yeah. now I was a fighter and now it's like, I'm watching this gear protect them and, uh, it feels good, man. So I hope to go back. Yeah. Hope to go back. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hell yeah. That's great. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that would, yeah. Cause even I've, I've we've talked about going back or, you know, I, I'd love to go with Nick or, or you know, or yeah, document man. or even with you guys just to, just to get back there and, and, and see what's up. going on. And like I said, I, 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 yeah, <laughs> like that. I, I have talked to uh, to Nine Line, like and Ty- Tyler Merritt, the CEO of Nine Line. He did a lot, bunch of stuff. Uh, we actually met in Ukraine in that first three weeks, so that's when we actually kind of linked up. That was like our kind of our first get to know each other. And then uh, he did some additional things <laughs> in, in those uh, the weeks after. So he sure, went back yeah. like three or four times and did, did some really good shit. So he would text me like, "Hey man, you want to?" I'm like, "My wife would murder me," <laughs> you know. Like I was just pissed. I already went in one time because we were supposed to yeah. do. Uh, we we're supposed to stay in Poland and help people evacuate across the border. Well, immediately they're like, "We're going in." And we can't bring people of outside of Ukraine, like you know, because it was all evolving. And, you know, we didn't know that. We we're like, hey, we just want to help get these, you know, uh, kids out of these orphanages into safer areas. So that's what we did. So we ended up getting them into Lviv, yep. into these safer buildings and, and and whatnot, and provide them food and clothing. So, and then coordinate their evacs out of South Central, you know, Ukraine for those two weeks while we were there. So, um, you know, it was a, it was a hell of an experience. It would be awesome to go back and see how those kids are doing. And, and I still get, you know, a bun- me- bunch of messages from, you know, like, like you, you know, people that I was with on ground in Ukraine, you know, still texting us like, Hey, you know, oh, yeah. fight's still on, you know, it's, it's gotten better, but at the same time you could, they're like, yep, my dad's enlisted. My dad's gone to fight now, you know, like before it wasn't quite that way. And then one of the guys is like, yep, I'm finally, he'd been volunteering and bringing supplies to the front line. And now he yeah. signed up and is like, yep, I got to go. I'm most likely going to have to go fight now, you know, just cause they're, I don't say their numbers are getting low, but they are yeah, obviously getting chewed up, you know, even if they're having success, they're just getting chewed up, you know? And so it's a, it's a, it's, it's crazy what's going on up there. But yeah. So, uh, what we're, uh, Thanks for coming on. What, uh, where can people find you at? And, uh, you know, on Instagram or yeah, and, and whatnot. Uh, two main uh, pages are pro- uh, predominantly our Instagram and our telegram. Uh, it's, uh, it's just project leaflet. Um, and we have a link tree on our Instagram mm-hmm. so you can find all of our support pages. Um, we work with mission essential gear as well. So like all of our apparel and our stickers and slaps that help support us do what we do. Um, they can all be found on their, uh, product as on their page as well. And that really just helps us like um, buy us a cup of coffee or, you know, get us another battery for a camera. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if it's any other mm-hmm. unit uh, or uh, team that wants us to embed with them, they can reach out to us at the project leaflet at gmail.com. And we'd be more than willing to embed, mm-hmm. tell your story, come take photography and um, maybe help you with some gear as well. Awesome. That's sweet. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, I hope everything goes great for you. <laughs> Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. I know your time's important and um, I, I love doing this, things like this. So I had a really good time with you, man. I, I hope we stay in contact. Absolutely. hundred percent. Absolutely. All right. We'll catch you later. Thank you, brother. All right.